Papa, we love you. We love your goodness. We thank you that you're just so faithful to us. And Lord, just as Julia had prayed earlier about you saved us and you loved us and you came and died for us when we were still wretched. And you chose us at that time when maybe nobody else would have chosen us, but Lord, you chose us. And we thank you that you just so, so good in your graciousness towards us as we grow in you. And Papa, we want to thank you for the journey ahead as a church. That, Lord, you've laid a gracious path in front of us. And that, Lord, even if we stumble and fall here and there, it's still a gracious path of your goodness and an inheritance for us as a church. In Jesus' name. And so thank you for your anointing over this morning's word. Lord, that we rise up, Lord, to to that which you are calling us into. In Jesus' name. Amen. Last week I mentioned we, uh, we had that amazing service of just worshiping the Lord. Remember? Last week we just, we just worshiped God. And... Um, there were, there were the times of, str- uh, of sort of like mm, struggling through and then crescendos and then another, you know, struggling through and then crescendos just in the presence of God. But we just worshiped the Lord last week. But, and I'd mentioned that um, George and I both had um, a dream of exactly the same thing. And um, George's dream was a week before mine and it was both basically the same thing in terms of we had gone to a large church where there was amazing community going on. Her church was a church that she was familiar with. She, she knew which church she was in. Uh, mine was just a, an unfamiliar but large church of people. There was a lot of community. There was a lot of love amongst the people. They were enjoying fellowship with one another. There was a lot of joy and laughter and all that which we enjoy as a community of people. But when it came to worship, we, we started to worship one, with one song. And, um, and in that song, the Spirit of God, I felt the Spirit of God just grip my heart. And I was engaged in worship. It was amazing. I felt like I was, you know, I felt like I was touching God. And then the song finished and that was it. And I, in that dream, I thought, what are we going to do for the next two hours? You know, if we couldn't worship God. And both dreams were exactly the same thing. There was one song and a complete sense of letdown um, because we didn't worship God. And so I, I want to speak about that this morning. I want to speak about our worship to him. And I feel God gave that dream because it's, it's a word for us. Because, yes, we want to develop community. We want, to, we want to be together. We enjoy being together. We enjoy family. But if God is not the center of it all, and if he is not glorified in it all, it's all about me. Me, me, me. And you know what? Even when we sing to the Lord, you can't go wrong when we start to worship him about his greatness and his goodness. The, the words, the, the song choice this morning were very prophetic. Um, they were a very good ch- uh, song choice this morning. They were very prophetic um, in where we are going through. But we need to lift up God. He needs to be our focus. He, we need to learn how to glorify God. We need to learn how to lift Him up and praise His name. And it's not all about me. It's not all about what I can receive and what I can get and, what he's, and, and, and so forth. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's about get, getting used to him being the glorious king of eternity, amen, of everything. That we start, to, we start to recognize that he is the king of everything. He's the king of my life. And so I need to start worshiping him like that. Um, and God is calling us, um, and he's calling us to this place of worship. I believe that's why he's given us that gave us that dream. And there was something, it was, um, who was here that prophesied about God giving, releasing uh, prophetic words, they were prophesying over George and I, I think it was the Alams. 
they would release, uh, that God would release words to us, and one would, ha- one, one would have the dream and the other one would have the, the, the same dream. And so we really felt that it was a word from God to us as a church. What happens when we worship God? We establish His throne. Amen. When you worship God, we establish His throne. Not so? Hello? Yes, we establish His throne. We put Him in His rightful place. The King of glory, enthroned on high. When we start to worship Him, we place Him in His rightful place. Enthroned. His throne. Amen? Not only do we enthrone him, but we become a people who move in and out of the throne room of God. We become throne room people used to being in the throne room of God. Amen. That's about intimacy. That's about knowing him. Amen. When we throne room people, it's because we know him. Amen. I can now come boldly into the presence of God. See, uh, I was on Facebook uh, <laughs> again, and, uh, and I was reading a post that, um, that somebody had posted, and it says, I'm a Muslim and I love Jesus. And, um, and so I looked at this and I thought, hmm? And then I read why the person had put it. And, and the person had put it says, I'm a Muslim and I love Jesus. And the reason why he had put it there is because he was declaring that Jesus was a prophet and all servants of Muhammad we respect and we, uh, we love. And I was grieved. I was actually more than grieved. I was angry. Okay, so it was gonna be my phone. Is it there? Oh, so, yeah. So I was angry. And in my anger, I thought, I need to post something. And... Um, and so I, I've got it. So I posted, uh, so I made up this picture quickly and I posted and, and it says, The world may want, want to silence all that is Christian, but not one prophecy has ever or will ever fail. I kept looking in the night visions and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom one which will not be destroyed. That's Daniel seventeen thirteen to 14. And then the New Testament scripture just parallels with that of be, about being the Son of Man. As you know, the Passover is two days away and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. He has an everlasting throne. Amen. He will always be enthroned. He will always be worshipped. And his dominion will reign forever. Amen. Amen. And I got to start getting this in perspective. And, and so my spirit was grieved. And I thought, no, he is the everlasting God. He is the king of kings. He's the alpha and the omega. He's the beginning and the end. And his throne shall last forever. And every people, every nation, every tongue will worship him and serve him. Amen. And that is the truth. That is the truth. And so... Um, when that gets on the inside of me, what happens? I want to worship Him. Amen? I want to worship Him because I'm knowing who He is. And last week, I, what happened was we went through struggles of worshiping the Lord. Amen? There were times I was, uh, you know, when I was worshiping the Lord and I recognized that it was hard for the congregation to sustain a, co- a whole service of worship. It was hard. People struggled with it. Amen? <laughs> Amen. Amen. 
We just got to admit it. It's what happened. People struggle to sustain worship and be in the presence of God, lifting Him up and giving Him glory. Listen, people, the reason you come here is not for us to have a little good time with each other and enjoy community. We've come to serve the King of Kings. And we've come as priests to minister to our God in worship. Amen. Because He deserves it. And so I need to come prepared to give Him the worship All the adoration that he deserves. That every cell, every fiber within my body needs to respond to God. Amen. In Revelations 1, 17 and 18. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. This is John speaking. "Then Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, the Alpha and Omega. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever, and I will hold the keys of death and Hades. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. This is his buddy, John, who reclined on his chest and used to say, I am the favored one. I am God's favorite. I am Jesus' favorite. This is his friend, right? He sees Jesus and falls down as though dead before him. In absolute, not necessarily singing, but in awe before the Lord. Absolute awe before the Lord. Amen. Why? Because he saw him. He saw him. And when he saw him, he fell as though dead before him. He didn't have to utter a word, but he became worship. Amen. He became worship because he saw Jesus in all his glory. Whoa. We need to see Jesus. We need to see Jesus. Do you know the phrase, and I've used it before, intrinsic value value obligates? Intrinsic value obligates is when I start to understand the value of something, I'm obligated to it. Right? I'm committed to something that I value. Do you understand? That's why you get things like racism and so forth. If If I can degrade something, then I don't have to value it and I don't have to respect it. But when that thing becomes valuable to me, I am obligated to it. Do you understand? And so what needs to happen is my uh, intrinsic value, when I start to see the value of something, it demands worship. Do you understand? So I can value money. I can value my job. I can value all kinds of things, and the more I value it, the more I worship it. Do you understand? And the key to praising Christ is prizing Christ. Is when He becomes all. And when I see the value of Jesus, I'm obligated in worshiping Him. Amen. The reason why we struggle to worship the Lord is because we have not seen Him. And that's not a condemnation, but that is a choice that we need to start to make. I want to start to pursue Jesus because He's called me to worship Him. And I don't want to worship Him out of falseness. I don't want to worship Him out of... uh, I don't want to make up something. Amen? Amen. I don't want to pretend in the presence of God. I don't want to go down on my knees and do all kinds of hula hula because um, I'm trying to make it, make it look as though he's wonderful. I want it to come from here. I want it to come, come from here because I know him. Uh, and I'm obligated to worship him because of who he is. Amen. Christ is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. Amen. I want to see the glory of Jesus. I want to see the glory of Jesus and I want to see Him glorified. I need to be so satisfied in Christ. Again, in 1 Timothy 6.6, godliness with contentment is great gain. 
Amen. I need to become so content in Jesus Christ that He becomes my all in all. That if He needs to separate everything and anything in my life that has become my worship, then that needs to go so that He can become King. Amen. That He can be enthroned and take His place in my life so that godliness with contentment is the greatest gain I have. That He becomes my all. When you see God as gain... Above all things, he is then glorified. Glorified in your body. And for him to be glorified in your body, you must see him as the greatest gain in your life. um, Above all things that might satisfy your soul. Amen. Why did David always say, sing, O my soul. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul, because my satisfaction for my soul is in Christ. Amen. We have all kinds of addictions. We have all kinds of things that we hold on to as crutches in our life to satisfy our souls instead of Christ. I want to be addicted to Him. I so want to be addicted to Jesus. I want Him to be the gain of my soul. Hallelujah. And when he becomes the gain of my soul, he is then glorified. He is then glorified in my body. Amen. He is glorified in my body when my soul no longer finds its satisfaction in anything else but him. Does it make sense? Romans 12 verse 2. Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. In this is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Now, if you've been in this church for a long time, you've come to uh, dedication services, and I've always used that illustration about the zebra, zebra, um, <laughs> zebra from those from Zimbabwe. Um, And the UK, so it's a zebra. Um, So when a baby zebra, I don't know what you call a baby zebra, but when a baby zebra is born, what happens is, the now you know a zebra has patterns all over its body. What happens is the mother zebra... um, protects the baby zebra from the, other prote- from the other zebras. So what it does is it keeps its body near the baby zebra the whole time. Every time the baby zebra moves, the mother zebra blocks the baby zebra's view until that baby zebra is completely familiar with the mother's pattern. So that when danger strikes and they have to flee, the baby zebra knows where to find its mother and the safe place. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Again, it's that condition verse covenant. Is I, not, I need to start changing the pattern of the way I see things and I need to see what's going on in heaven. When I start to change my perspective to a heaven's perspective, and I, that's what we need to do. We need to start training ourselves from an earthly perspective to a kingdom perspective. Right? I am transformed when I start to change the way I look at life, not from an earthly perspective, the earthly realm, my earthly eyes, to a kingdom perspective. I need to start thinking kingdom. I need to start breathing kingdom. What is in heaven, I release here on earth. When I start to think kingdom, I start to release kingdom. Amen. I become heavenly minded. I become kingdom minded. That's when I can say to somebody who is sick, what is in heaven be released here on earth because there is no sickness in heaven. Let it be released in your body in Jesus name because I've been training. I'm training myself not to see the condition of this person's life, but to see what what God's intention is for this person's life, regardless of what it is. Amen. And you can go to anybody on the street and you can see their condition, but no, change the pattern of the way that you think. 
and change your pattern to the kingdom pattern and start declaring the kingdom of God over those people's lives. Amen. And all the more for your life. Right? So my perspective, I need to shift my perspective. And we did that on Wednesday night when we were praying for Morgan for James. Duncan came to the front and said, well, we know what the condition is of these children. And the condition is dire. It's depressing. It's hopeless when you look at it. And so we were praying from the condition perspective. Duncan then came to the front and says, I feel that we need to start looking at what will these children look like if they were not held by this condition. And so we had to re-visualize these children and their lives being restored to them, their, their childhood being restored to them, the joy of family being restored, the joy of those parents having healthy children being restored, and to start praying from that perspective. And that caused faith to rise up on the inside of us as we started praying. Do you understand? We need to change our perspective. You see, it's so easy for the doctor to declare, to declare stuff over your life. But what does Jesus want to rather declare over your life? Amen. We are so conditioned by what the doctor wants to say about this person's life. But we need to hear what Jesus wants to say about this person's life. Amen. And so I've got to change the pattern. I've got to change the pattern. Because when I change the pattern, the pattern of my walk will change. The way I walk will change. The way I view life, the way I live will change. Amen. And you will become a wellspring of hope. So God is calling us, I believe, as a church, as a people, to steer, to change the way this nation is going. Amen. God's called the church to be in the nations to change the nation. Amen. God has called us, yes, he's called the body of Christ all around the island to be doing that. But I'm speaking to us as a congregation. He's called us as a congregation to steer this nation into its destiny. Amen. And to bring his authority here into this nation. To reestablish the authority of God in Cyprus. Amen. That there is no other authority in this nation. There is no other voice in this nation. There is no one else speaking the destiny over this nation but God. Amen. That the government is on his shoulders and he is the authoritative voice in this nation and he has the last word. Amen. But he can only have the last word in this nation if we establish his authority here. Did you all say amen? Did you all say amen? Amen. Amen. Therefore, it is up to you to establish God's authority here in this nation. That's why he's put us here. How do we establish God's authority in this nation? By building his throne. How do we build his throne? By worshiping him. Becoming a people of worship. Where we establish a center. Where we establish a portal. Where we establish a place that breaks open the heavens. That becomes a Bethel. A gateway for the kingdom of God through worship. Where we break open the ceiling. And we say here we will establish the throne of God in this nation through worship amen hallelujah by a throne room people a people that know how to go into the throne room of god because you know what when you're in the throne room of god you see earth in a different perspective amen you see life in a different perspective wow when we're worshiping the lord here you make all kinds of promises. You make all kinds of declarations because you're in the presence of God and you think everything is fantastic. <laughs> Amen. There is nothing like it. And God's calling us to be a people who walk like that. Amen. Amen. <laughs> 
We are, we are called a throne room people to establish his government and authority here on this earth. It is his worshippers that go before the army. Amen. When the, when the worshippers go before the army, there's actually almost nothing more for the army to do. Because they've already brought his reign They've already brought his authority. They've already brought his kingdom and, and his rule in that place. What have they done? They've brought his dominion into that place before anything else. God has called us to be the worshipers in this nation. Amen. Cool. And that is how the battle is won. David's makeshift tabernacle. Um, 24-7, the house of worship, God is reestablishing. Amen. God is reestablishing that. And it's when, you know, when the Lord says, I will, I will uh, restore all things, one of the things he is going to restore is David's tabernacle. Amen. Now, David's tabernacle, let's go to Amos um, from verse, uh, chapter 9, from verse 11. In that day, you know, when I was reading this scripture, I felt like this was a prophetic word for us as a church. Hello. Look, I got excited. Yeah, I, I, but I want the anticipation to rise. I want the, uh, yeah, you're excited. This, I believe, is a promise to us. It's a word to us. Okay. Now, aren't you excited to know what it says? Woo! <laughs> you see, that's how I need to go through all the Word of God. I'm excited to hear what it says because it's for me. Okay. In that day, I will restore David's fallen tent. I will repair its broken places, restore its ruins, and build it as it used to be, so that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations that bear my name, declares the Lord who will do these things. The days are coming, declares the Lord. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when the reaper will be overtaken by the plowman and the planter by the one treading the grapes. New wine will drip from the mountains. I just want to stop there. This morning in the pre-service prayer meeting, when I was asking the Lord for, for covenant, I saw the Lord holding a bowl of new wine. And as, we, as I said, I see the Lord holding a bowl of new wine, a prayer all started happening around that. And God was just giving revelation on it. And the revelation is, is that um, new wine obviously needs a new wineskin. Amen. Because if you pour new wine into an old wineskin, it's what? It bursts. And what happens to the wine? It's wasted. It's wasted. God wants to pour new wine out over us as a people. But what he's saying in it is that you need to be a new wineskin. The old needs to go. Stuff needs to go. Because what's going to happen is if there is stuff in the way of the new wineskin of the, or in, of the new wine, it's going to be wasted. And through the generations, Jesus... God, uh, uh, Jesus has poured out new wine. He has poured out the Holy Spirit. And what has happened when he has poured out the, the Holy Spirit is that people have built their empires. People have got rich on the kingdom of God. Because what has happened is there's too much of me in the way of the new wine when it's been poured out. And I become self-indulgent in the wine of God. And I use it and waste it on myself and my insecurities. God is looking for a new wineskin, that nothing is wasted, that we become kingdom mindset, that it's all about the kingdom. Amen? Say it with me. It's all about the kingdom. Now, when the early church was established, they got it. It was all about the kingdom. I mean, what would, you know, what would take over your life for you to sell everything you've got, to give everything you have and just share it. 
What kind of mind does that? One that is totally kingdom-minded. Amen. If I am kingdom-minded, so kingdom-minded that I just give it all away, sell it and give it all away, because I am just consumed by the kingdom of God. And Ananias and Sapphira come along. They don't have it. They're not kingdom-minded. They are still thinking, how can I save some for myself? And zap, out of the picture. You're in the way. You're in the way. Wow. When the glory of God starts to increase, when the kingdom of God starts to increase on the inside of us, that's when the holiness of the presence of God increases. Amen. So, anyway. God wants the, His glory in the hearts of His people. He wants the glory and kingdom in the minds of His people. That, that's what we're thinking. That's how, we, that's how we're living. His kingdom. Can you imagine a people like that coming together on a Sunday morning besides every other hour of the day that they come together? What worship must be like? Imagine, just imagine for a moment. The building will shake. That's probably why they had to meet in the fields or out there somewhere because the building would probably crumble. Because there would be such worship release from a people that is all about the kingdom of God. Amen. Hello. Hello. This is what God wants from us. This is what the Holy Spirit wants from us. He wants to pour out new wine. Eh? Amen. <laughs> anyway, let's carry on. New wine will drip from the mountains and flow from all the hills. I will bring back my exiled people from Israel. They will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will plant vineyards and drink their wine. They will make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant Israel in their own land, never again to be uprooted from the land I have given them, says the Lord Almighty. We have our inheritance. We know this is about Israel, but we know that there is an, there is an outworking in our lives here in Cyprus. Amen. About God establishing us here, giving us our land, giving us a place, our own inheritance, where we can be established so that we can bring the presence of God here. Amen. Hmm. That was good. Amen. Yes, that was a good scripture. And God reaffirms in Acts fifteen sixteen that yes, he is going to reestablish David's tabernacle. Amen. That place of just constant worship. David was 30 years old when he became king and he reigned 40 years, a complete generation. He reigned 40 years. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And in Jerusalem, he reigned over all Israel and Judah for 33 years. I found those numbers very interesting, isn't it? They just so parallel with Jesus. 30 years, he becomes king. 33 years reigning. Anyway, that's just a by the bar. Um, and it was predicted. What is it? Th Tom, was it 27 years or 30 to 33 years that there were constant prayer and worship? 33 years. 33 years of constant 24-7 prayer and worship. Constantly. On the go. On the go. See, um, in 2 Samuel 6, what happens is when... Um, when David went and brought the ark and brought it into Jerusalem, what you, we all know the story. He just robes and he starts to dance. I mean, because the presence of God has come, there is nothing that is going to stop him in his, in his expression before the Lord of worship. Amen? And so he, he is crazy about God and he is going to show how crazy he is about God and nothing is going to stop him, right? And he does it. He expresses his absolute jubilation about the presence of God coming into Jerusalem, right? 
What happens is Michael, his wife, Michael, his wife, sees what's going on, and she is indignant. She, she, she rebukes him and says, "You just rode before the people and before the maidservants," and, and she's all embarrassed about what he did. She's embarrassed about the expression of worship, and what happens is she becomes barren. It's scary. It's so scary. Do not judge somebody's expression of worship before God. Do not look down on anybody who expresses themselves wildly in the presence of God, no matter how they express themselves. Just be very careful. Amen? Let us not be embarrassed to worship God. Do not be embarrassed about worshiping God. Because it brings barrenness. But life and fullness, protection, prosperity, and everything is released when you begin to worship God. The protection that was over Israel. The favor of God that was over Israel because of worship. Amen. It's just incredible. Isaiah 54 says what? Sing, O barren woman. Sing, O barren woman. Sing, O barren woman. Because when you begin to worship, when you begin to sing, barrenness is turned around. Hallelujah. Sing, O barren woman, because more will the children be of the desolate woman than the woman who has a husband. Extend your tent pegs. Make ready for the expansion, because prosperity will come when you begin to sing, when you begin to worship, when you begin to enthrone God and place Him in His rightful place. Amen. And that's what God wants of this nation. He wants this nation blessed. He wants this nation overflowing with prosperity so that it can be a blessing to the nations around. He's calling this nation to be a storehouse. Us because there is times of trouble that will come. But this nation needs to be so overflowing with the goodness and the blessing of God that there is no lack in order to give. Amen. And so he's calling us to establish a place where we can say, this is Bethel. This is none other than the gateway of heaven. Amen. Hallelujah. So did that stir you? Yeah, well, that stirred me, and I just feel like God is leading us into something, and He's speaking to us. He's saying, this is the direction I want you to go. We've been asking God, God, show us the direction we need to go, and He's, he's saying, worship, 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 worship me. Come into the throne room. A throne room people is what I want, and when you become a throne room people, there are going to be release, releases of the kingdom of heaven, of signs and wonders and healings and deliverance and people set free of all kinds of things. I believe this is when we are going to see revival, when we are going to see those, uh, the, the plow or the, the, the harvesting over, overtaken by the plow or whatever, the, that thing. <laughs> is that we are going to see such an acceleration of the kingdom of God if we establish and become a people of worship. So listen, when we come together just for two hours on a Sunday and we can't maintain worship, let's change. Let's change the pattern. Let's change the pattern. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Let's, let's close with prayer. Hmm. Yeah, let's stand. Oh. Now, Papa, we, we know, Lord, um, as we were praying this morning in the pre-service prayer meeting, where we said, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what you've prepared for those who love you. And Lord, just this last year, there were things, Lord, that you brought us into that no eye had seen, no ear had heard, no mind has conceived, Lord, what you had brought us in. We couldn't even imagine, Lord, what you, what you caused to happen this year. And you brought it, us into it, Papa, because we said yes. And so, God, we want to thank you that that's what you're looking for. You're looking for a yes people, a yes heart, a yes life to you. 
and to your kingdom. Because then you bring us into the no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what you have prepared for those who love you. And so, Papa, we just say yes to you this morning because you make it happen. You make it happen. We don't know what it looks like. We don't know how to get there. But you are looking for a yes and you become the vehicle. And so we say to you, Papa, in all earnestness and in the presence of your spirit here this morning, Lord, hear our hearts as we say yes to you. In the mighty, precious, glorious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Amen.